Hey, welcome to the 98th episode of Just Shoot It, a podcast about filmmaking, storytelling, and directing. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan, and today we have Michael Tucker on. Michael Tucker is a video essayist, and he does a very, very popular show on YouTube called Lessons from the Screenplay. And it's a show that I've kind of accidentally watched over and over and over, because sometimes I'm watching it a video on YouTube and someone's like, hey, here's like an analysis of what makes a great antagonist using the Dark Knight as an example. And I'll click on it and then I'll just end up watching all these videos. So those videos are made by Michael Tucker. He's actually a director turned video essayist in his quest to become a better screenwriter so that he got to direct better things. If you like lessons from the screenplay, you're going to love this conversation. But before we do that, I've got to know, Oren, what have you been working on lately? Well, thank you for asking, Matt. I'm kind of in this weird development phase. We've been doing this podcast long enough that I've been in this phase a few times since we started. So I've Did talked about it. Did you call it a development phase before you had a podcast? Yeah, I think so. It's like the phase where I'm trying to figure out what I want to sure. do next. I guess. Did you put that fine a point on it? Is all I'm, I'm teasing you I, about. Yeah, I mean, I think I've always kind of been very aware of the ebbs and flows of a director's career. Sure. Like there's times where I just have too many jobs to even take them all or do them all. And then there are times where like like right now, like literally like three or four of the companies that I regularly worked with like have gone out of business. <laughs> and so, you know, you always have to reinvent yourself, re-edit your reel. I don't think I've cut a reel in like a couple of years, you know, revisit the website. I I'm kind of a, a little bit in that phase right now. I'm waiting for my show, the Warigami show, the uh, to finish all the contracts. So we put we're like the writers' room is in hi, on hiatus. I just finished up these commercials, so I'm pitching on a couple other commercials. But really, it's like I have zero idea if I'm going to get them or not. Sure. So in the meantime, I need to make stuff. So I think I want to make a couple spec commercials. The production company I'm with is like very much encouraging me to do that. Uh, And my manager I know would be ecstatic if I like sent him some treatments. Sure. Um, So I've kind of been, you know, I have all these ideas and all these things that I've started and kind of written little mini pitches on and I want to figure out what I should focus on and kind of go ahead with it. And one of the things I've been thinking about of why film school is good is because you get assignments and you get mm-hmm. deadlines. That's why I love getting jobs. And what, external forces saying, Oren, finish yeah. this thing. Here's the we shoot need date. You to do this. Here's yeah. the casting date. Here's the this thing. You know, to me, that's what a producer does on a job is they like tell me I have to be in a certain place at a certain time and they're they're really making sure things are driven forward. Where's the shot list? Where's the storyboards? Where's this? Can you call the script We need this. You're, yeah. yeah. But when you're making your own stuff... You have to be that voice. So I was curious, Matt, do you ever like assign yourself? Like I have to write, you know, 10 ideas on Monday. I have to write, like choose three of them and write paragraphs about Mm -hmm. them on Tuesday. Like do you, how do you do that? Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, it's funny. I'm in a similar situation where I think we both know no matter what, if you don't come up with new material, your career becomes stagnant. And we're both very happy with our careers, but of course we want to continue to grow and stay relevant. And you know, it's a there's a shark mentality. You have to keep swimming, right? Um, and so I have a few techniques that I like to use. One that I've just adopted relatively recently. That's it's not perfect for creative work because it's hard to know how long things are going to take in terms of idea germination and all of that stuff like you know that a two pager is going to take you less time than a treatment than a full length screenplay etc cetera, etc cetera, you know but like that stuff just still just it's hard to know how fast you're going to be able to crank it out sometimes so you just have to give yourself the time to do it but i i have started uh you know i use a task management system called things but it's just like google note or keep or any of those other ones you know it's just a list basically it's a checklist that's all but Every morning I ask myself, what are the five things that I have to get done and that if I don't get them done, I'm in trouble on? Try to just do those. That's pretty helpful, you know? And also when you're dealing with a nebulous sort of creative problem like come up with new ideas, that's a hard thing to check off the list. But like being specific of like spend 30 minutes brainstorming every day that you know you can do and isn't necessarily results oriented. 
you know, so those are kind of things that you try and be specific about what the actual thing you need to be doing is, is, is helpful. Even with kind of those ideas and those practices, I've kind of been butting up against a new problem that I wanted to talk to you about that I think is perfect for this conversation. It used to be that I was okay with working all the time. And I am okay with that. You know, so I don't have like a set of office hours if someone wants to work on the weekends. You know, my wife and I both take time to be together when we can, but also I'm not mad if she has an acting class that goes late one night or we have to wake up early one morning or we have to shoot on the weekends. All of that, it's all fair game. And so that had just meant that I was just working nonstop, which was fine and great and I liked it. But now because there's fewer people holding me accountable sometimes, you can't really expect to like write 12 hours a day. That's not going to happen, right? So I, I want to figure out a plan of setting office hours for myself that are really manageable, you know, like just a couple hours in the morning basically where I'm not doing email, I'm not sending meetings for that time, I'm just going to go to a coffee shop and work for that number of hours and then only write on it basically. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what the same conclusion I'm getting to, which is I need to do what Anna Kana does and just really schedule my day and say, hey, from 12 to 1.30, I'm going to work on this project. From you know, 1.30 to 2.30, I can have lunch with someone. From 2.30 to 4, I'm going to be doing this thing and just stick to it. And if it's like a writing job or, or like a writing project I'm working on that's like a personal project, I think it's okay to even just sit there and look at a blank document as long as oh, I'm not 100%. doing anything else. Yeah. It's just as long as you don't go on Facebook or you don't go answer the phone. Or, yeah. Or, that's the stuff. Well, before we get to our conversation with Michael Tucker, we're going to get a quick question and answer with our sponsor, Film Casualty. We sat down with our friend Cameron from Film Casualty to talk a little bit more about the ins and outs of insurance and how the fine folks at Film Casualty could help us out. So let's say I bought a camera and I'm bringing it to a production and I drop it myself into an ocean and I have it insured through you guys. Would it be covered even if I damaged it myself? Because I know my iPhone, if it's got water damage, they don't cover that but they cover like other types of damage. Well, it depends on the insurance that you bought. For Inland Marine, it's all perils coverage. So unless there's a very specific exclusion that says we will not cover if Oren takes his camera and throws it in the ocean, it's gonna be covered. But it always depends. And that's why there's film casualties so we can help you navigate these situations. more information about how to protect your film business gear project and crew go to filmcasualty.com slash just shoot it that's filmcasualty.com slash just shoot it insurance for every kind of filmmaker thanks to film casualty for the sponsorship and to cameron for talking to us about that and now here's lessons from the screenplays michael tucker thanks so much for coming to talk to us Uh, yeah thank you for having me yeah well so how'd you get into this uh, so I uh, moved to L.A. Uh, to be a writer-director with a focus on directing, actually. Did you go to film school or anything? Uh, yeah, I went to uh, UC Santa Cruz, the film school there. Oh, oh sure. Cool. Very um, like theory-based. Very like You're yeah. a proper academic. That's an interesting thing. Yeah. Did you yeah. give yourself your own grades Is that in that <laughs> time? Uh, it was post to that time. Okay. I think the spirit of that lived on, but... Uh, no, there were definitely grades over okay. there. There was a time at UC Santa Cruz where you would grade yourself because they were that progressive. Yeah. yeah. But it still is quite uh, theory-oriented, right? Like it's, yeah. not a, it's not a ton about production exactly. Yeah, and that was what I think was really interesting about it. Um, for me, it was that I, you know, in high school, basically since I was able to hold a camera, I had no problem getting out there and shooting it and making stuff. And so... The production side uh, was always something I enjoyed and did automatically. Mm-hmm. And so going to a school that really focused on theory and like the history of film, I think helped me, you know, exercise that part of my brain mm-hmm. a lot. And the production side was sort of just getting going. And it was basically like, we have new cameras. And if you want to do something, do something. 
And I was like, that's great. I will take it and I will do something. So and culturally, was was there like a lot of people who were interested in shooting things with you? Like, was it, was it easy to find that group of people? Or Yeah, it was pretty easy. I mean, I think a lot of the people in the program were kind of trying to figure out what aspect of filmmaking they wanted to get into. Um, but I pretty quickly found my group of people that had my similar sensibilities uh, and just wanted to be out there making films constantly. It's so funny. Like <laughs> I, Normally I'm like, let's skip the film school talk. But this, <laughs> you, you're our first banana slug. And Orton and I both, I lived, grew up in uh, Northern California, grew up in Sacramento. Banana slug being the... the that's the mascot, the mascot, mascot of yeah. UC Santa Cruz. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but but so I've always heard about this program, but never uh, really talked to anybody about it. Do you find that because it was so theory oriented that like did you have films as homework or anything like that? Were you assigned creating things like that or? Yeah, because they did have a production track. It I wasn't see. as you know. Uh, fully formed as the theory side, but it, there was a production track. So I was in that. I see. Um, so there were like, you know, go make a six minute short film mm-hmm. or like a documentary style thing, but definitely more of the focus. And uh, I think most of the classes were on history and how to analyze film as text and all that sort of, you know, high right. concept stuff. Cool. Which is all seems like it's like too obvious. <laughs> like now that we know what you are doing a lot of now. Yeah, yeah. It, it really, I think, helped yeah, set up that part of my brain. Yeah, you're like one of the few people that really applies film theory <laughs> as directly as you possibly can. Yeah, I mean, you're yeah. like a film professor yeah. on YouTube. Yeah, it's, kind of, it's pretty weird because that was definitely not what I thought I would ever be doing. And I think even when I was learning it, it was like, well, this is interesting, but I want to be out there making stuff. Mm-hmm. And then now I'm very grateful that I had to exercise that part of film analysis. And so did you always plan on moving to LA after film school? I wasn't quite sure right after. Like I my two friends that I made there, they moved to LA right away and I hung around for two years in the Bay Area, um, working with a friend who was doing a video series on sound and we got to interview like sound mixers and sound editors for these major films and got to go to the studios and so I had a lot of fun doing that and I got a lot of practice editing that sort of documentary special feature format kind of a thing but after two years I realized that if I wanted to actually make films I needed to be in LA right yeah I guess they do have like really good sound in the Bay Area like Lucasfilm kind of the best yeah Skywalker sound yeah Yeah. Skywalker pretty amazing Yeah. yeah yeah their stuff I mean I haven't heard anything sound better than their work yeah just kidding (laughs) <laughs> um, so, okay, so you moved to L.A. to be a director. Mm-hmm. And when was that? That was 2010. Okay, so yeah. not that long ago, eight years. Yeah, seems like a long time now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I moved to L.A. and right away I met up with my two friends from film school and we didn't want to be like so many people we knew that moved to L.A. to do something and then didn't do anything. So we started a YouTube channel slash website called Finite Films where we uh, made a short film every month as sort of like a boot camp to just like we're always making something. And then we kind of made it interesting by making it so that every short film was based on constraints that were submitted to us by our audience. So people could like go on our website and say one scene takes place in the rain or one character loves olives and then vote on their favorites, and then we take the top seven, and those were our constraints for writing the script for each short film. Mm -hmm. And how did you get people involved in that? Because I I also worked worked at Disney, and we basically did that a similar idea. We're like, hey, tell us, like, a funny story, and we'll write it into our script, and, like, you know, all the the stuff people submitted was absolutely (laughs) useless. (laughs) Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a lot of, like, friends and family at first, and... I think we also made, like, we would go through and manually vet the like greater list before we like put mm-hmm. it out to vote to like weed out the ridiculous things or inappropriate things. But yeah, we sort of over the course of the year that we did this developed a pretty like a nice core fan base that really enjoyed it and prided themselves in coming up with like clever constraints once mm-hmm. they saw that we were actually using them and doing stuff. With What's it. like a cool constraint that you remember? Um. There were, I mean, some were just like really basic, like 
done in the style of a film noir. And then some are really specific, like uh, one was like every film or the film has to take place entirely in real time. And Mm. that was voted on along with one character slowly goes insane and one scene must take place in the rain and it all has to happen at night. And Ooh. so there was this, like, it was this perfect storm of... Right, that seems, <laughs> sounds easier to write than to shoot. Sure. Yes, <laughs> that, that was the case. Yeah. In real time, what a great constraint, though. That's that Yeah. Alone would have been really fun. Exactly. Just without water, really. <laughs> I like um, real time, but something has to happen really slowly. Yeah, oh, that's fun, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, sl- yeah go, slowly yeah. going insane. Yeah. Um, who were the other filmmakers? So one was uh, my friend Alex Cayeros and then Ryan McDuffie. Uh, and yeah, they were sort of the two people that I just gravitated to really quickly at film school. Um, and we worked on each other's films there and sort of developed this really nice working relationship that translated really well to this you know, constant short film machine that we built. And you were just financing them yourself? Yeah, we did a uh, Indiegogo for the first one, and I think we raised eight thousand. Uh, and then we quickly realized that movies cost a lot of money, sure. and that we <laughs> like. So we basically used that eight thousand just for the food budget for each of the twelve films, mm-hmm. and then it was a lot of self financing and a lot of generous support from the parents of Finite Films sure. Foundation. Shout out to Finite Films parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so did you have a, another job, like you were doing other jobs on the side? Uh, a little bit, that? yeah. I'd saved up a little bit before moving down and then would just do random editing gigs here or there, shooting, whatever. But yeah, luckily for most of that first year, it was spent making stuff and burning through the savings, but getting to focus on actually creating stuff, Mm -hmm. which was really great. And through that, we sort of, you know, we would hire one of our friends who was an actor that knew somebody else, and then that person knew somebody else. And so by the end, we'd sort of grown this tight-knit community of, like, creative people that really loved doing film and understood that, like, we can't pay them. So they were, (laughs) that was a very nice resource. It's kind of an inadvertent way of building out that uh, group of people, you know, like Mm -hmm. what a happy accident to have, like, because we talk about LA can be a little hard to get to know people at first, like if you don't have um, those initial connections, just kind of the beginning of that snowball, it can be hard. So like we talk about like, you know, UCB or, or like, you know, just trying to find another friend somehow. Um, so that's interesting. Just making 12 short films <laughs> is a pretty good way to, to make is. some pals. And yeah. were you directing them or did you split them three-way? Uh, yeah, we split them through. So of the 12, we each wrote and directed four. And the writer was also the director. It, that wasn't like mandated, but I'm pretty sure it worked out that way. Sometimes we had like co-writers, but for the most part, everyone who directed also wrote. Cool. Okay, so at this point you had received zero lessons from any screenplays. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, I think that's fair to say. So okay. how did you segue into into that? The sort of long story short version was, you know, we did this year of short films and then uh, Alex and I made a web series out of it and uh, out of one of the short films we made, which then a producer saw and wanted us to turn it into a pilot. And so we spent a year trying to develop it into a TV pilot. And over that year uh, is when I realized that I'd had a lot of practice on the directing side and not on the writing side, and that I wasn't that good of a writer. And so post that kind of falling apart, I did a lot of uh, like documentary editing, edited a feature doc and a few other things. And then a doc project that we were working on fell through and uh, suddenly I had this like money that I'd saved from all these gigs and a bunch of free time and I was like, okay, I want to go back to doing creative narrative things and I know that my weakness is screenwriting, so how do I create a framework that will force me to learn as much as I can about screenwriting? Can I just rewind for one second? How like. Why did you think you were a bad writer? Was it because you didn't like what you wrote or was it because you were having trouble sitting down and writing? It was more the like not liking what I wrote. Like I I think I was very sensitive to, you know, I I had a lot of film experience so I could tell when something wasn't good and that was very much a roadblock where I would start writing something and be like, this isn't good. Right. And then just 
So then couldn't get over that hump. You have to yeah. get drunk <laughs> and then write. That is that is right? one solution. Yeah. Or, yeah. It's I mean, it seems like always the, the answer is in some way to like stop judging yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. Find some way to turn off that filter. And so yeah, so that was part of part of the struggle. But but yeah, so I decided to start writing a bunch of screenplays and then I decided, well, I'll write blog posts about each screenplay to sort of help me, you know, retain the knowledge and maybe share it with people, build up a following potentially. And in the process of writing the first blog post, I was like, I think this could be a video. And like, you know, I'd seen every frame of painting and Nerdwriter and these other video essays. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I think I could do that. And so I looked around to see, well, is there already like a screenplay video mm-hmm. series? There must be. And I didn't find one. And so I was like, okay, I think this could be a thing. And that was sort of the inception of the idea. Look, obviously you didn't do like a Cliff's Notes on the Fight Club <laughs> screenplay. How did you figure out what to focus on that was interesting to you, like to analyze it in your way? I think I was trying to come at it from a, like I sort of imagine myself in film school way back when and like the things that I wish I had learned, not just like the techniques, but also the mindset, like the appreciation of the fundamentals of storytelling. Cause I think I always assumed like, yeah, I mean, you know, you write a screenplay, but like this like inception is so clever. Like this movie does this thing. And I was really always drawn to the clever aspects of writing and so with this, I really wanted to focus on like, what are the like basics behind that? Like mm-hmm. what drives the audience to care enough so that when the clever things happen, it like means something to them. So that was sort of my personal like marching orders to myself. I, I just wanted to know uh, that first essay, that first blog post you were working on, did that make its way into a video? Did that end up being your first video? Um, it didn't end up being my first video, but I did ultimately do it. The first blog post was on When Harry Met Sally, mm-hmm. I think. And then the second one that I was working on was also uh, was Inside Out, which also became a video mm-hmm. much later. Um, but they changed a lot from blog post to video. Sure. Yeah. So what's the, and can you remind us like what your insight was for those two films? Uh, for When Harry Met Sally, I... I was always really amazed that there's not a whole lot of like overt conflict happening. Like there's not like a bad mm-hmm. guy. It's not like, oh, he's going to lose his job if he doesn't do <laughs> X, Y, Z. Like it's just people in rooms talking. And so I was looking at how in those scenes, the relationships that are happening, the little changes that you're seeing make it so engaging. Um, and also just like, Billy Crystal and Meg Ryan are sort of like cheating anyway, so that's there's that. Um, and then, what was the other one I said? Inside oh, Out. Inside Out. Um, that one, I kind of looked at the process of creating the story because Pixar had a really nice set of special features where they talked about the writer's process and how it came from his own personal life. And so it was sort of using that and looking at elements in the script to show how writing can be uh, used to investigate things about yourself or just things in the world that you want to learn about. So I think the like kind of tagline from that one is like, write, don't write what you know, write what you want to know. And that, that can be a nice motivator and let you discover things and then share them with people. Oh, cool. I just remembered which other one I watched today. It was the one on um, Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it was called... uh, what order to give information or how to yeah, I think unfold the, information or right. something like that. And I thought it was interesting because you compared, you would show the scene from the movie where there's like two lines of dialogue <laughs> and then you would show the script where there's like 20 lines sure. of dialogue. I love that part. That's true. Yeah. Is, so um, is that something, so obviously you read a script and watch the whole movie and do you do it at the same time to find <laughs> moments like that or is that just on that specific video? Um, I don't do it at the same time. Usually if I'm doing a video and reading the script, it's it's a movie that I already like a lot. And so like with Ex Machina, I had seen it several times. So in reading the script, I was just able to pick up like, oh, this wasn't in the movie. So uh, I don't do it at the same time. Um, but sometimes I do go back and like rewatch it 
after having read the script because I'm like, wait, was mm-hmm. that in the movie? Or like, and that's when I can spot like an arrival. It was interesting reading the script and being like, I think this is in the movie, but this is not where it is in the script. And mm-hmm. then going through and seeing how they rearranged it. Yeah, I think that sort of detective work is part of what I think makes video essays fun for people who are interested in creativity but aren't necessarily filmmakers too. You know, like mm. there's a little bit mm-hmm. of um, sleuthing that you do for them. That's like if there's that surprise and that extra level of time and thought. Like the thing that you can only catch if you, you know, take the time to watch a movie a bunch of times and then also read the screenplay. They get to kind of like have that little nugget. Well, so how how has the show affected your directing career? What's going on with that? <laughs> um, it kind of put it on pause <laughs> for it. Uh, pretty much since I started the channel, um, the videos take up a lot of time. Like it's mm-hmm. a full time job, and it's been really great. And I think you know I wanted to make sure before I went back toward narrative storytelling that I. would learned and extracted enough to feel confident Mm -hmm. going back that direction. And so I think that's sort of one of my goals for 2018 is to start putting this knowledge to work now. And one of my friends is working on a feature and it's been great, like helping him and realizing, oh, like I have this wealth of knowledge Mm -hmm. that is actually like I can apply it to a real world situation and it makes it better. So yeah, so that's kind of my, like I said, my goal for 2018 is to find time amidst the videos to get a script written and start directing and do some short mm-hmm. films and kind of now that I have this audience also that is hopefully mm-hmm. somewhat invested sure. in me, like finding ways to bring them along on the journey of creating features. Yeah, and stuff a, like an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter nowadays, <laughs> it would be a different deal than the 8,000. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, <what's laughs> Less better. reliance on moms than that. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Um, do you think that the lessons you learn from these features are mostly going to be applied to shorts too? Like if you do write a short film script, will it be perfect? <laughs> That's <laughs> Yes, or <Oren. laughs> Michael like, is too uh, modest <laughs> to, to, to speak the truth, but yes, of course. <laughs> I feel like that's the like underlying pressure that I dread. It's like, well, now whatever I do has to be like amazing. No, and perfect. no, yeah. the whole point is you're to even better at explaining. <laughs> turn off the filter. Better. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh I, well, what about this as a pitch? Why, why don't you make a short film that's not that great and then do uh, oh, a wow, video that's essay that's on your oh, short that's explaining good. what went wrong? Yeah, yeah. I like that. Like, try your hardest and then <laughs> give it like a month or two and then come back and tear it to shreds. That's interesting. Yeah. That try your hardest but give yourself a time limit. Like, yeah. after I have two weeks to write this short film script. Yeah. And then we're shooting a, a month from now. I like that. That's for in my last video, actually, I kind of put a call out to my audience since it's possible this year that I'll hit a million subscribers. It was like, what's a fun idea I could do for like a million? Mm-hmm. And a lot of the comments were like, analyze one of your own videos and stuff. So I feel like that could be a fun idea is like okay. document that whole process. So well, clearly not an original idea. <laughs> but well, we're about to hit 100 this. episodes, so what should we do? We told you what to do for oh. a million subs. Oh. Think about it. All right. I don't mean <laughs> I'll pitch, let it but, yeah. um, <laughs> So going back to the directing stuff a little bit, you know, it's funny. I, um, I'm curious to see when you like go on meetings or you're meeting people, obviously certainly people care about your videos and they're excited by them, right? Like I just had uh, lunch with my lawyer the day before yesterday and he brought up your uh, Dark Knight video. Wow. <laughs> and was like telling me about... Like, That's how, about the great... Uh, the great... Um, the antagonist. Antagonist. The antagonist. Yeah. And was like... He's like a super nerd. It's great. He also <laughs> knows what planet Wookiees are from. Anyway... Shout out, Danny. Kashyyyk. Um, <laughs> Kashyyyk, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I should introduce you to you. <laughs> You're going to get along famously. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so, uh, yeah, he brought up, oh, like, oh, I love this uh, video essay series, lessons from the, from the screenplay. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so excited. But it made me realize also that, like, there's certainly a contingent of uh, Hollywood people who watch your videos and think about them. You know what I mean? Like, h- have you experienced that, uh, you know, in, in the last year and a half that you've been making videos? A little bit, and it has kind of like blown my mind when it's happened. I went to IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project, in uh, New York last September, and it's basically a 
place where independent filmmakers get put in rooms with lots of different industry people and mm -hmm. meet people. And that was kind of the first time where I was meeting like some of these producers and they were like, oh yeah, like we know your show. We love, it's usually, we love that Dark Knight video. So that's <laughs> the one that if people know. They Is know that the one. big video? Yeah, that's oh, okay. the one that like. Yeah. It's very good though. So. Exponentially yeah. has more views than the rest. Huh? Wait, why do you have a theory on why? I think it's a lot of reasons, but I think it's the Dark Knight. There hadn't really been a video essay about the Dark Knight and it's about the Joker and everyone loves the Joker. And I feel like it's a really good example of what a great antagonist can be and how it how it grows and affects the protagonist in a very direct way. So I feel like it was just an interesting idea that people were interested in and that they could understand very quickly. And it came out right after Suicide Squad came out. So there was already mm -hmm. sort of like talk about the Joker. So I feel like it was just like this, a whole bunch of things came together. It sounds like it's also probably a video that a lot of like agents and That's producers send yeah. writers yeah, yeah, <laughs> and definitely. say like, look, your antagonist sucks, watch or, this video. Or like you'll hear, and this is my favorite, this will happen um, oftentimes with uh, these videos where like you'll get a note and I'll be like, yeah, okay, bro, I get it. Like you think you went to film school because you want <laughs> And these videos are great and then oftentimes the, the note isn't wrong, but like, you know, you can you can see and sense a trend of like, oh, these videos kind of gained popularity, and like it it maybe codifies the language or the terms under which someone can kind of wrap their head around. It mm -hmm. gives them a vocabulary, I guess, is what I'm saying, which mm -hmm. is interesting. Yeah, for sure, and that and that's why I think when I I had a meeting with CAA after uh, you know one of the videos came out, and it was. And like weird hearing from her like oh yeah yeah we all know like the dark knight video so like what are you working on next and just mm -hmm. realizing that it had like penetrated like the industry to yeah, a certain yeah, absolutely extent. like i said my lawyer just brought it up <laughs> so what's the meeting at caa about is it like let's turn your your <laughs> your video essays into a sitcom uh <laughs> no thankfully <laughs> um it was sort of just a it was part of that IFP filmmaker thing that I had done and it was sort of just like let's make a connection and a lot of the meetings were like you know like we want to see your script like mm -hmm. let's talk about it and so it's a lot of like awesome as soon as I have a script I will give it sure. to you because I haven't had time because I've been making all these videos <laughs> because the lessons on the screenplay from a, from the screenplay is like your procrastination tool <laughs> It kind of is. I mean, that I think makes it's three of us. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, except you are getting subscribers off of it. We're just watching it. It is. It's at least a productive way of. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what What also is interesting to me about it is that I feel like um, there are only so many ways that a writer can gain visibility outside of just having something produced, right? So, like. You know, I think the entree that you gain by being recognizable as like a performer who also writes or like a stand up or something like that. I, you know, I come from the comedy world. I'm always the most jealous of a great stand up who can also write mm -hmm. because then it's like, oh, you see their set somewhere and then it's just immediately you have something to latch on to. So when you get sent their script, you know you just know who that person is. Like you can put a na face to a name and all that. Mm -hmm. But this is a different way of getting in there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think it was it was definitely a weird moment when I realized that it seems like to make the leap to narrative directing, you have to have a script, which means you have to be a writer to a certain degree. And I also had that moment of like being really jealous of the people that were just naturally good at writing because mm -hmm. that was just something I'd never really put the effort into. It seems like a thing that's relatively new to Hollywood that if you want to make it as a director, you have to have a script attached. Yeah. Or that you want to. The thing that Matt and I are saying all the time as directors is that you just you need to be generating material. Mm -hmm. Well, so I guess on that note, like what what would you write a script about? Like kind of all the work that you've been doing for the last year and a half has been on kind of analyzing other people's movies. If you wrote a feature, would it be about a guy that analyzes <laughs> something? Or like you what's... could do adaptation, right? That could be fun. I have a few ideas for a video essay. If I ever do a video essay about adaptation, that could sure. get yeah. multi-leveled. I find that I'm really interested in like, 
crime noir mystery thriller stuff. Like I think that's why you know my the video I just released, like the girl with the dragon tattoo, is like right up my alley of like really like a fun mystery and like with interesting characters. And so I, I'm always drawn to either like dark crime things or lighthearted romantic comedies. Mm-hmm. And sort of like sure. those sure. polar oh, opposites. Right, exactly. Yeah, we'll get you. <laughs> um, so that and like, I think sci-fi is always something that's interested me, like Ex Machina, which you mentioned, I right. think is one of my favorite films of the last several years. So I, that kind of like, Character based, but with cool stuff happening. Like also, an elevated premise, right? Elevated genre. Yeah, I do like visual effects and some editing too. And I find that a lot of times you're exercising a very different muscle when you're doing when you're analyzing something or when you're, someone's giving you something that's already made and you're trying to find what's working and what's not working with it. Mm-hmm. It's like a different muscle than like sitting down and saying like, "Oh, this." I met this really interesting person, and it would be interesting if that person was a robot or whatever, right? Like, yeah. So it's like I guess I'm trying to figure out how you channel like your lessons from the screenplay into writing the screenplay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's I'm very aware that those are different skills, um, and I think that's something that I want to try to, as much as can be, explained via video, try to keep digging into that more and, you know, hopefully trying to interview screenwriters and learn more about the process. And like, I think, I think back on me in film school and I, and I think probably for a lot of people, the reason they gravitate toward like directing or the cinematography is that like, that's what's in front of you. Like that's the more accessible thing mm-hmm. that people are like, Oh, I know what a shot is. Cause I can see a shot. Whereas like story structure is you know, a very Mm -hmm. ephemeral thing if you don't have, you know, this knowledge. So I think I also would love to try to like shine a light on what it looks like when a writer is writing Mm -hmm. and like expose that because I think that will help. It would help me a lot. And so hopefully it would help other people understand what writing actually is and looks like. So you've obviously Uh, analyzed a lot of screenplays and studied writers and writing a lot. Do you think... Like so, you did the uh, an essay about how Logan and Children of Men, the end is the beginning. Like that, the end is inevitable, and and how from the very opening of the movie, you can predict what the end is. Uh, is do you think that's like a byproduct of someone that just has like good instincts, or do you think that this is something that like the writers have in mind and are trying to like craft as they're like writing the screenplay? Like like are all these lessons? things that are instinctual in these writers, you think? Or are they like, oh, well, I've learned these things. Or are they now intellectualized? Yeah. 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 Uh, I don't know. I, I The impression that I get is that it's different for everybody. Like, I think there are writers that do, like, plot things out very meticulously and outline and structure and structure, structure before even, like, writing a word of the script. And then I've also read interviews with writers that say, like, I don't do any structure. I just start writing and it's all, like, organic. And yet they end up with a film that's very structured. And so I think there, it is, I think, a thing that can be instinctual for sure. Like, I think if you are a good self-critic, you can feel out this isn't working. This is working. Kind of keep course correcting until you arrive at something that feels right, which probably fits you know, the familiar model that most of us have been exposed to. Mm-hmm. I wonder if those writers who you're saying, like some are a little bit more by the book, some are a little bit loosey-goosey. I think there's a writer's, like a, a how-to book basically for every one of those styles and everything <laughs> in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you're so good at pulling like the little nuggets out of the different texts that uh, that it seems like you love the most. Do you have a specific... Um, book that you kind of find yourself coming back to over and over again or so the book the anatomy of story by john Mm -hmm. truby is the one that i've quoted the most in the videos and i think that one resonated with me because it was a response to the blake snyder style Mm -hmm. of like the hyper like on this page this happens and and i think what i liked about truby's models that it lets you visualize your story in a more organic way and from a like a character centric way like rather than on page 30 this change happens it's like what is 
what is missing in your character's life and what can you bring in to that then forces them toward the person they need to be and just it it frames it in a way that clicked a lot better mm-hmm. for me and i think that's sort of what i try to do when going through screenwriting books is find what are the things that resonate for me and i think it's different for different people yeah um, i wonder if though uh your favorite thing that's definitely that's got to be some sort of reflection on you in a, a, an even broader sense also, I just just started rereading uh, Save the Cat a little bit, and I forget he talks about blank check so much, and he that really shit is does. so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> like for it to be like the trendy book right now, yeah. like blank check is just like a weird, dumb, Richie Rich ripoff. Right. Uh, respect to Blake, Blake Snack, <laughs> but like, like you know, can maybe pull a, a different reference, man. Yeah, yeah. So. I like what I like about Save the Cat is, I mean, as much as people hate on it, is that it is very like closest thing to like a fake answer to your problems sure. as, <laughs> as an engineer, right? You want to yeah. say, okay, on page ten, this happens, right? Yeah, and he actually his second book is actually, I think, a little. I, I like enjoyed it more. It's like save the cat strikes back or something oh, right, because yeah. he he said that he like basically lectured his save the cat you know premise to to all these students and they're like okay but you're telling us to like set up this person's world what does that mean how do we do it like what do I write and he so he breaks it down even more he's like well mm-hmm. to set up a person's world I like to see like where they work like what they do for fun and like where they live yeah. and it's like okay so you're a kid in the suburbs. Your bike gets hit by a mean, like by a bad guy, <laughs> and he gives you a check. Yeah, but Sorry. it's but when you're stuck on something, it's like, oh yeah, that's easy. Well, this is what my character's life is at work. Like sure. I've worked on projects where, like, the character doesn't. We haven't even figured out what their job that if they have a job, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I think it just kind of forces you to like think about these yeah. things that hope any experienced writer would have thought about, but kind of maybe some newer writers would. Yeah, not for, force about. yourself to ask the question. Yeah, I'm a fan of uh, Dan O'Bannon. What is this? Oh yeah, what's the name of that book? Um, I don't remember. It's really I, funny I to me though. One. It's like yeah. re- it's real. Sna- I recommend it. Okay. It's like he's the lethal weapon guy. No, that's uh, um, Shane Black. No, Dan O'Bannon is Alien. alien right? Oh, Alien. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And but he's like I always joke. Dan O'Bannon looked like a Bob Odenkirk character. Like <laughs> he wears like bow ties and stuff. And his book is. I'm sure there's really great insight into it, but most of it is just kind of like when I was working on this, you know, <laughs> kind of like folksy um, sort of advice that's um, very charming. And Aileen's my favorite. Anyway, sorry. I saw that you also quote from a book called Notes on Directing that I'd never heard of. What's that book? Yeah, that book was recommended to me by my roommate uh, who I lived with in LA for six and a half years. Uh, Scott Martin, who we moved down from the Bay together, and he was all about theater and wanted to be a theater director. Mm. And so it's a book that I guess is popular in the theater circles. And so it's notes on how to be a director in the theater world. But I found that there were a lot of, I think, insights that apply everywhere, and a lot of them like work for a writer also. Wait, wait who's it by again? Uh, Frank Hauser and Russell Reich, mm. I want to say. It's like a little, my friend's always called the little blue book because mm-hmm. it's a little blue book. Um, and it's like, I think it's the two of them, they just like over their careers wrote down little notes to themselves. And so it's sort of like a curated list of notes. Uh, takeaways like. and stuff. Yeah. That's cool. That's great. So when you do a video essay on like Children of Men or Logan, how much of the directing do you take into consideration when you're analyzing these screenplays, the, when you're analyzing the writing? I try not to because the idea is that it's a channel mm-hmm. about screenwriting. I I can't help but, and I think that's also why I talk so much about Fincher films because I love Fincher's directing, but like he's not a screenwriter, so it's like, uh uh-huh. <laughs> But I try to as much as possible if if I notice I am being influenced by how it was directed, try to extrapolate the like the storytelling lesson from it mm-hmm. or like find like what is the thing that they're doing that's not just stylish, but how is it telling the story in a more in a clear, efficient way, ideally. Um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the more meta aspects of starting a YouTube channel. 
Uh, we actually we had a question uh, from Twitter that I think probably summarizes it nice and clearly. Here, I got it here. You got it? Thanks. For that. Yeah, we have a question from at Devin Holmgren. He says, would love to hear your thoughts on the advantages of using a video platform to discuss the medium of filmmaking. Yeah, and more specifically, I think um, we were talking before we started rolling about how YouTube is an ecosystem that's kind of designed to reward a different style of filmmaking than you like to do. Yeah, very much. I mean, I think YouTube is designed for people that make a vlog every day Mm -hmm. and the algorithm really determines who sees what video and it's, you know, they keep the details of the algorithm hidden, but it's pretty clear that the algorithm favors people with very regular content that happens on a schedule and that they know like people will consume as if it's like a TV show and gives them as much watch time as possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's like really schedule and watch time are kind of the two big variables, which ergo, means that like labor intensive videos suffer right right so yeah so it's a tricky thing to uh navigate but I, I feel like the reason there are video essayists that have found success there is that i think being able to dissect film via video is a it just lends itself to it in a really nice way i think screenwriting is a little bit trickier because there's a lot of reading in my videos sometimes mm-hmm. and reading isn't the most fun thing to do when you're watching a video. You do a great job, though, uh, just to, to point it out, like of you've got a very clear style and like style guide of like how you do interview footage or how you show, you know, you'll do the split screens of like, oh, this is what's happening on the page versus on the screen. That stuff is very elegant and I think speaks to, A, how hard it is, right? That's very thoughtful and takes a lot of work, but also the care and professionalism that you apply to it, I think, is apparent and just reinforces the thoughtfulness of the message. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, oh, this is great. This is real stuff. You know, it's not just a teenager shouting into the phone. <laughs> right. Thank you. That's, yes. That's yeah. No, it's great. Great to hear. Yeah. Um, I kind of think of YouTube as like it's like a platform, and they have their whole subscription model built into it. You know, I don't think any of us have. All of our parents have been to YouTube and watched videos, but none of them subscribe to YouTube channels. I don't know the stats now, but it used to be like uh, in just a tiny amount of people are actually using subscription boxes in any meaningful way. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it, it's directly correlated with age. Like the older you are, the less likely you are to have ever subscribed to anything. Right. Or well, to I, even know what the subscribe button is. <laughs> right. I guess I'm subscribed to lessons from the screenplay, but I think of it much more as like a, the podcast model, where I subscribe to like 20 podcasts. You know, some of them I'm like more into right now, and some of them I'm less into, especially like the political ones kind of like have faded into the background for me a little now. But, you know, every week or two, there will be something new, and I'll be excited to hear it if I happen to have time. And sometimes I'll be really busy and I will miss like a few episodes. And come back, but it's like very different than like a Logan Paul or a Casey Neistat or a makeup vlogger or a kid that <laughs> is opening a toy, right? Like, I feel like it's like you can't really compare those things in the YouTube algorithm. I know it's important in terms of views and stuff, but in terms of like getting viewers that care about like what you're showing them, it seems like you're doing just fine finding those people, you know. I mean, yeah, I, I hope so. I try. It's, it is it is a weird kind of thing to navigate also because, you know, I think I could be getting a lot more views if the content was shorter and more clickbaity. Mm-hmm. And I think because it, it is so algorithm-based and it's like, what's the thumbnail and what's the title? And that dictates how many new people discover it a lot of the times that it's it's kind of a choice that I have to make consciously of, like, you know, I'd rather create good content that the people that you know know me will appreciate mm-hmm. versus you know a five minute like you'll never believe how sure. Fincher does this thing or whatever. That you could write a few more Batman videos, or <laughs> probably <laughs> right. <laughs> According to the stats, every video should just be about the Joker. Yeah. yeah. So, um, would love to just hear like the quick version of your process of like how you choose a movie how you figure out what to do with it and then how long it all, you know, the editing and all that stuff, just the real nitty gritty. Yeah. So it's, 
choosing the movie is kind of a combination of what do I feel like talking about. Um, I also always look through the comments section of my videos to see what people are recommending and if there's a trend. Like maybe Amadeus or an Emilio Forman movie. <laughs> right. Or Birdman. Or, or Birdman. <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Twitter, guys. Yeah. Um, Birdman is, I get that one a lot. It's interesting. It's, huh. it's really interesting seeing the cycles of like what movies are like in fashion to uh, request. Like, and that's one of the reasons I did my Black Swan versus Whiplash videos. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So many people. I think people. that's one of the first ones I saw. Very cool. Yeah. That was, that one was my favorite. I me. actually, I was like working on a screenplay that had like a similar structure, and I like watched that video and I was like trying to see. How I can apply those two models <laughs> to my to my story? At what point um, do you have your your thesis as well? So you pick your movie, right? Yeah, you're going through the comments. You're kind of like, oh, I love that movie. Well, Amadeus you, is the one. Right? You have to have a thesis to pick the movie, right? If everyone's saying Birdman, well, but you have no insights to pull from Birdman. Yeah, it's that's kind of usually the biggest barrier. Is like clearly everyone wants me to do Birdman. I don't know what I want to say about mm -hmm. Birdman, and that's. So, so I think that's part of the choosing process, and occasionally it's, you know, well, I'll just rewatch this movie, and that's what happened with Whiplash. Like, I didn't like Whiplash the first time around. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it was it, like annoyed me kind of, but then I saw it again. Did it annoy you because of Miles <laughs> <Really>? Teller? <laughs> because he's like kind of annoying. No, I don't really remember because I've I've come to like it. It's probably like some like jealousy also of. The director and sure, how, sure. how good he became so yeah, quickly. Yeah. So yeah, I, fair, once I got over fair. the ego aspect of it, I was like, oh, this is really well made. Like, it's it's such really a good movie. movie. Yeah. I sat with my brother who's a musician and he's like, nobody drums like this. <laughs> <laughs> Your hands don't bleed when you drum so fast. I'm like, yeah, but the director was a drummer. He's like, Eh, I don't buy it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so you kind of find the thesis as you go. Yeah, yeah. It's. I think it's. Sometimes it jumps out at me, and it's like, oh, this is like, like the Dark Knight was like, if I'm going to do the Dark Knight. I want to talk about the Joker and antagonists. Um, but sometimes it's like I have an inkling, and then I have to read the script, and then in the process of reading the script and taking notes, it's like, oh, this movie does this thing really well. I want to learn more about that. And so, oh, that's interesting. Are there ever moments where you're like, ah, I'm trying to figure this thing out for myself personally, like Inside Out, right? I guess, yeah, yeah. Or uh, the Children of Men versus Logan mm -hmm. video. I was reading a book about you know act structure and was reading the chapter on the first act of a film and trying to like wrap my head around all those details. And as I was reading it, I kept playing the first acts of those two films and I was like oh, maybe that's what I want to talk like I knew I wanted to compare them but I didn't know what what specifically and then reading that was like oh that's something I want to learn and like get a good handle on and I think it applies well here mm -hmm. and so that's sort of where that came from. What's funny is like when I see video essays like if Nerdwriter does something or you do like I feel in my mind like okay Logan is officially considered like a good movie like I love Logan, you know, but I don't know that it was like it's not like nominated for an Oscar or anything, you know. But then when I see someone like you say like this is a great movie, I'm like, okay, it's like official, right? Cuz like you like you talk about how movies become trendy to have liked. Like when Harry Met Sally came out, it probably wasn't like people probably didn't think this is a movie that's going to stand I, the test of time. Yeah, that's I guess that's true, right? Like people thought it was more popcorn than Yeah. Or um I mean there's so many movies that are famously like did, like Ghost was like one of the worst <laughs> box office sure. movies or whatever. Right? Really, I didn't um, and now it's like yeah, it's classic. It. So yeah. I don't know. It's it's interesting. Like once people start making video essays about things, you're part <laughs> of like what's canonizing some of these films, yeah, like a Logan. Yeah, because I was thinking about like yeah. <laughs> well, well, but also if you're thinking about comments and inspiration, which is part of YouTube, right? Like that's kind of the conversation that you have to have with your fan base. Um, things are zeitgeisty. So, like, how recently have they come out? How well received were they? You know, like, if you were doing video essays when Raging Bull came out, you probably, mm -hmm. like, people wouldn't be in the comments like, Raging Bull, you know <laughs> what I mean? But, like, or Ghost, right? So, it's interesting to me. I wonder um, in 30 years, will we still be talking about Logan or not? And also, who mm -hmm. cares, right? Like, you know, <laughs> it's still an interesting, good video. And maybe there's something 
it, it becomes a bit of a time capsule that way, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, but sorry, just to go back to, so this is your full-time job. You have Patreon subscribers as well. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like all of the stuff, there is kind of that weird pressure of like keeping people happy or interested and also making maybe just cultural references that a younger audience would be familiar with, you know? Are there things that like you've held back from when you're like, oh, I wish I could do that Raging Bull video, but who would care? I guess Raging Bull is probably a, a, would probably a classic. Do cool. Yeah, would do great. Yeah. Um, uh, will you do a Raging Bull video? <laughs> I, I should. Have, I'll add that to my list. <laughs> yeah, there you go. For a while, I was keeping an actual list, oh. and then I was like, this is not possible to <laughs> yeah. sustain. There are times where I have to consider that. Like, I think there were a few videos that I made in a row that like didn't do super well, and like mm-hmm. when Harry Met Sally was one of those. And it's like, well, yeah, there probably aren't a whole lot of like eighteen-year-old people sure. that have seen when Harry Met Sally. I've watched the video multiple times, so I'm making Thank up you. for it. You're, you're the reason it has views. <laughs> sure, there you go. That's crazy, um, really. Yeah, yeah, it makes like, sense. I guess yeah. it did like okay eventually, yeah, yeah. but and so I, I feel like it's ideally it's a balance of something that's topical that like young people can relate to and it is a touchstone for everyone and then mixing in like classics that I think people should be more aware of and mm-hmm. like when I did Nightcrawler I wasn't sure that anyone was going to like oh, that's right. respond to Nightcrawler but a lot of people ended up really liking it and then I get a lot of comments of people being like I'm going to pause this and go watch the movie right now <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay that's great that movie is so good yeah. it's so good Jake Gyllenhaal is so good in that I feel like I, and I we derailed the conversation about how you make these videos. So you yeah. choose a movie, you come up with a premise, you write a script? Um, yeah, so I, I come up with my theory. I do lots of research, and like find interviews with the screenwriter and listen to the DVD commentary, and sometimes that's helpful and sometimes that wastes my time. Are there still DVD commentaries like on Logan and stuff? There are. Not a, There yeah. wasn't one on Logan, but like... Uh, that's Get why out. I buy them. I was surprised. Oh, really? That there was oh, a commentary cool. for Get Out that was like really interesting. Yeah. So yeah, they're they're fewer than before, but they they are still there. Um, and you find interviews like on YouTube? Yeah, basically, or like different podcasts that have had the screenwriters on stuff like that. Um, and so then I write an outline for a script, and then write a bunch of different drafts of the scripts. And is there like a form regular format that you? Like, is there a structure to your video essays? I pretty much start each one assuming intro, where I set it all up, go to title, and then the first act, which is topic one, then topic two, topic three, and then conclusion. So like an elementary school essay. Right, yeah, basically just like the exact like standard formatting. And sometimes they end up being longer and more complicated, but that's... The ideal that I shoot for, and like ideally, like twenty five hundred words seems to be like hmm. a good sweet spot. Do you write in Word or Final Draft, or what's your? Uh, I use tool. Ulysses right now. Uh, hmm. It's an iOS app and, and a Mac OS as OS X app. It's but a word yeah. processor. Yeah, it's like, do you know Markdown at all? It's like no. a, a way of writing. Is word. it like Highland kind of? Uh, yeah, kind or Fountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's basically Fountain, but for not screenplay formatting. I see. Huh. So I've just found that I really like writing that. It's just very clean and keeps me very focused. So yeah, so I use Ulysses and the formatting is just sort of one sentence is like a paragraph and I just kind of break it up that way. Um, and so your topics, do you split those also into like an intro? This is what the topic is. Here's like three examples and here's like a conclusion. Uh, kind of. I'm like I'm not as like precise about it or like not I don't demand that each section has that but I try to make sure each section has like a question that I'm trying to answer and that it ends with the answer and so that's as I'm doing the multiple drafts that's what I'm trying to like filter for it's like why does this feel long it's because I'm rambling about this thing that doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about um and you're starting uh, to kind of like mark clips from the movie and stuff and from the screenplay. Yeah, like during that I, I copy and paste stuff from the screenplay that I know I want to use and and if there's like a interview I try to like write down the time code that the screenwriter said whatever and so ideally when the script is done it's like a basic blueprint for starting the editing process. Do you record your voice kind of is that the first thing you record the script? Yeah, yeah, record the script, choose the takes, 
and put that all in the timeline and then kind of build from there, mm -hmm. put in any scenes that I know I want to use. And then from that sort of basic skeleton, fill it out and put in temp graphics. And then once that's done, do all the animations and After Effects. And then... And don't do you edit in Final Cut X? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Premiere. Yeah. yeah. Oh, somebody else does. Maybe Nerdwriter? I think Nerdwriter and Tony Zhu from Every Frame of Painting oh. both did Final Cut X. Oh, yeah, because yeah. I saw at the end, they're like, if you know, a lot of people asking about editing my, my show or whatever. I use Final Cut X, and here's a two video you can buy it to see how or something. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, cool. So... Do you get notes on it? Like, are you a one-man band? I'm essentially a one-man band when it comes to the creation, but I, I always send it to I have my, my group of people that give me feedback. Um, so I send it out to them. My mom is always the most reliable, so thank you, Mom. Hey, that's really? cool. Yeah. Nice. She's, like, retired and, like, doesn't mind. Just, like, sure. she'll read every draft I send her, so it's always nice. Even if it's I know, I know it's bad, that. it's yeah. like, oh, oh my you, mom will encourage me. So you send this, you get notes on the script before you even record it. Yeah, I do, yeah, lots of notes on the script as much as I can. And then, because obviously, as always, the better the script is, the less work is required later. Do a rough edit get notes on the rough edit, and then do final motion graphics, final sound pass, thumbnail, and subtitles, and all and that who, stuff. And sorry, you, uh, you do a rough draft on Patreon, is that right? Am I misremembering? Um, What's your Patreon uh, uh, incentive? There's different ones. It's usually on Patreon, it's like extra content, so okay. if there's something that was like cut out, from the video, uh, that's what I'm post that. Gotcha. So that's different than like a previous draft. It's like, oh, this is a yeah. segment that just doesn't fit anymore. I've done that a couple times, like with the Dark Knight. My special feature was like, look at all these different drafts I went through before arriving at. And that must that be one. what I'm thinking of. Yeah. And I'm assuming most people know this that listen to our podcast. So Patreon is a platform that lets fans support the people they're fans of financially. Yeah, yeah it's like rolling Kickstarter, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened to the other two directors that you did finite films with? Are they directors now? Um, yeah, I mean, we all, you know, we're all still friends. Uh, one has done a number of short films and he's working on his feature screenplay. Um, the other, uh, Alex Calleros, has done a lot of documentary editing also. He just finished editing a Netflix true crime documentary. Um, so Which one? Sort of, hmm? What's it called? Uh, oh, what's it called? I think... I don't know that it has a final title yet because it hasn't re released yet. Okay. It's like a dangerous mind or like the most dangerous mind. I don't know. It's about, I probably shouldn't say what it's about. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so we all keep in touch and we're all sort of in the same boat of like doing our day job gigs to, you know, finance the creative things and go in that direction. So is lessons from the screenplay your, your day job kick now? Do you think of it that way? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it's become. And I, I'm very lucky that pretty much right after I launched it, it became successful enough that I was able to bank on it. It was kind of, I describe it as like a race against my savings account, where it was <laughs> like the Patreon was going up and the savings account was going down and they met just at the right time. Um, so yeah, so that's my day job, the thing that I have to to do and I always want to do and keep putting out videos for people. And so now it's sort of about finding holes in my day where I can be working on creative other projects and finding ways to expand the channel and add new content moving forward and stuff like that. Do you have deadlines for yourself? Like do you try to release every two weeks or something? Ideally it's every three weeks. It sort of became one a month for like the second half of 2017 just because I got really burnt out doing it um, but ideally this year I want to try to get to every other week like one every two weeks and sort of hone my process and try to like push myself to mm -hmm. be more productive with it maybe get a research assistant that'd be nice I'm yeah. trying to figure out what the best mechanic is for that bringing mm -hmm. someone in I mean, well, it's interesting because you set out to be a director originally, which is like this job where it's like all about collaborating with like a million other people. And now you kind of <laughs> have ended up doing this thing that's mostly yourself. You're a one man yeah. show. I mean, it's that's part of my personality that 
like I have no problem with that. Like I'm always very comfortable by myself. And I think that's one of the hurdles that I had to overcome earlier to like become a director and learn how to collaborate was that I can be a control freak and like I want to make sure everything's perfect. And the best way to do that is for me to do everything. <laughs> right. But then, you know, that has pitfalls as you go on. Yeah. Like I've been the last few weeks not, well, I directed something like a couple of weeks ago, but it was a, kind of been a few weeks before that since I had directed something and I was kind of just like craving, like mm. sure, just <laughs> being on set that, yeah. and just like that human interaction. Yeah. Um, when I'm alone, it's like I just will do anything but sure. be productive. <laughs> um, like watch these videos. Yeah, I would just watch your videos. That's like, not yeah. a joke in the slightest bit. I know if there if I have other people I'm working with, then I'm like accountable to someone. But right. when it's just me, I'm like, I mean, I'm not going to be mad at myself if I don't write anything right now. <laughs> this feels like work, sorta. Yeah, it's helpful. Well, awesome. Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your process with us and kind of your whole story. It's I mean, your show's great. Uh, Hopefully, our listeners that are not familiar with lessons from the screenplay will be uh, after this episode. <laughs> yeah. So, um, youtube.com slash lessons from the screenplay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Twitter? Uh, Twitter is at Michael Tucker LA. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, well, Michael, will you stick around and endorse with us unpaid endorsements? Uh, yeah, unpaid absolutely. Unpaid endorsements. So, like many of us, uh, I'm pretty addicted to my phone. I'm like, uh, it's become a thing that has started bothering me in a significant way. And so um, my friend Chris told my friend, my, my friend Chris told my wife about this thing on the iPhone 10. I think you can do it on the other phones as well, where you can change it to grayscale. You can toggle it between grayscale. Mm-hmm. And so you have it like grayscale and color. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so it's basically now my phone is in black and white. I'm showing the guys here, uh, which makes it way less cool to look at. <laughs> and so I try to put it in grayscale as often as I can just so that um, I'm less likely to fall down that rabbit hole of checking Twitter real quick or, or Instagram or any of the favorite things that I have that I just kind of end up sucking away all my time on. So um, you can do it on the iPhone X. I bet you can do it on the other ones as well. Just dig around in your settings and it's just, you know, you just click it three times and then it's back to color, back to black and white. And um I think it's made things a little bit better for me. I'm just taking back a little bit of my time. Cool. Um, so that's my endorsement. Yeah. Uh, I did that. I One of the short films I directed was a film noir. And to get myself in like black and white mode, I did that. Where mm. I just like kept my phone in black and white for like a month. Did you use it less as a result? No, I yeah. still used it a lot. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I'm just kidding myself. I feel like that wouldn't stop me. Yeah. I mean, it's a real addiction. I'm sick of it. I was yeah. thinking about quitting Facebook, and then I was like, "Well, I, I do what? all the posts on the show." <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> to so, I think my unpaid endorsement can kind of piggyback off of oh, that. Perfect. I recently found an app called Forest, I think, or maybe The Forest, mm-hmm. uh, and it's basically designed to help you get over your phone addiction. Where it's an app that you open and you set a timer, like thirty minutes like saying, I want to be focused for 30 minutes. And so you press the button and it plants a tree in this like virtual garden and you can't leave the app for those 30 minutes or else your tree will die. (laughs) And so you have to just leave your phone where it is and like you can't touch it and you can't check anything. Uh, And then when that timer goes off, you have like a full tree. And so it's like, it's kind of a way to, Trick you into like it just adds some resistance, it's like gamifying it's a game. Yeah. yeah, but why do yeah. you care if your tree dies? I don't know because because you're dies. a person. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. Why um, do we play games, Oren? I like that. I'm I'm down because I've what's used it called f- the forest. I think either the forest or forest. And there's a a a plugin for browsers also, so you can use it. Yeah, it's just forest, so you can use it on your computer, and nice. that's why. I, that's where I use it the most. It's like can't look at Facebook or Twitter or Apple.com or Amazon.com or, while this timer is going. Or your dream will die. I use Freedom uh, on my, mm. which will block you from like certain websites, and you can just be like, "Hey, block me up from everything," or just uh, specific things on the list. But it doesn't work well on the phone. I find mm. it kind of messes up my email. So I'm going to definitely use that. 
that's exciting. Yeah, that's cool. I need yeah. to do that stuff, but I, I won't. <laughs> um, but I did install this app I told you guys about called Calm that people probably know about according to the ads I saw for it. It was the most downloaded app from the app store, but it's it's like Headspace. It's like a meditation app and I'm I never really done that, but it's like free. You can do like a week free. It's called like the seven beginners, seven days of calm. And it kind of teaches you how to meditate. So I'm not sure I'm doing it right, but it's, you know, it's basically 10 minutes each day of just like sitting and breathing and not doing anything else. And it's, it's, it's really hard to do. Um, it's actually really hard for me to just find a place where like no one will bug me for 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, where I can like close my eyes and, it won't feel weird, but it's cool. It's like not spiritual at all. It's very much just like about like being present and stuff. And there's like 21 days of calm, which is, I haven't started yet, but that's the next one. It's also free. So I think you can get at least 28 days of free stuff there. Um, so I don't know. It's kind of cool. Uh, and the other thing I was going to talk about is it's just an Instagram or just a like a guy's blog I found today. Joey L, J O E Y L dot com. He's a photographer, and uh, I was just like, you know, watching videos on YouTube, and somehow I saw him in some video and checked out his website, and I, I just found it super inspirational because he's like, he does like portraits of people in like Sri Lanka and like Syria and like kind of female fighters, like fighting against ISIS and all that kind of like journalistic photography stuff, but he also does like beer ads and like, you know, he did like all the photos for that new movie Hostiles with Christian Bale for their whole marketing campaign. He does like billboards, he does celebrities um, and he travels all over the world and he also teaches classes. Like I wanted to get like a cool picture of like this guy in the snowstorm, but I wanted to show students in the classroom how to take this photo. So we just rented this like snow, party snow machine, you know, and got like a a background and he has like kind of photos like behind the scenes photos of how he takes all his photos, you know, like what, mm, where he stretches cool. his that's strobe awesome. lights and what camera he uses. And I just found it inspiring because I think, uh, you know, a lot of times as directors, we're like forced to declare what our genre is and what we do. Um, and he, you know, you have to kind of choose between the artistic or the documentary or the video essay or the narrative. And when you say that you can do everything, people don't hire you for anything. Yeah. But he's really, into just being good at like a few different things. And one of the things he said in a video I saw today was that he is always like making new things and new styles because he's like, no one, he's like, if, if I just do get work off of my current work, I'll just keep on doing the same work. So whenever I want to try to, I want to try something else, I'll go out and do it myself and then show people like, Hey, you can hire me for this too. So just a little bit more of that just shoot an ethos because I think at least Matt and I sometimes get a little complacent and are like, so who's going to call me for the next job? <laughs> you know, but we're not really just going out there and making stuff that we want to make for on fun. our own. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. anyhow, that's it. I did do that one drone shot today. I was yeah, showing was Matt. I Ooh. wanted to do like um, some spec commercials and things and I thought one something that would be fun is taking my drone you can if you handhold it you can kind of use it as, as a steady cam without it flying cuz like the gimbal is kind of stabilizing the camera uh, yeah. and i thought it would be really cool to just handhold it through a house follow a character as they're doing something in a house and walk out and drive off and then it turns into like a drone shot so did a little test today with my friends That's actually cool. my airbnb uh, renter and oh, nice. his friend that were there. I was like, hey, can you guys help me out for a second? <laughs> That's um, awesome. Happens to be someone I know. But uh, yeah, uh, so I don't know. I'm hoping to make more things. Agreed. Awesome. Well, Michael, this was great, man. Thanks so much. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, you can check out all the stuff that we talked about uh, at justshootitpod.com. We'll have links to the channels and everything so you don't have to memorize anything while you're driving. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at justshootitpod and me at Mr. Matt Edmo. And me at Smitey Pileg. And this episode was edited by Christopher Robert Gray. And our webmaster is Ewan Williams. And the music you're listening to is by the artist Jazar and from the Free Music Archive. If you can leave us an iTunes review, it's super helpful for us. We'd appreciate it and we'll read it on the podcast. 
and we will catch you guys next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.